Hey guys, so welcome back. Well, we're going to get back finally into this uh, 1951 radio, this uh, General Electric Clock Radio, Model 517F. Uh, a while back we went through part one where we went through and looked at this thing and did an introduction kind of uh, how the thing operated and how it worked and, and we took the radio out. And our approach to this was, first of all, Let's find out if the radio works. Um, see if it's got silvomica disease or some other problem with it that would basically, you know, kick this uh, project to the curb, make it a part set. Because uh, the case is in really bad shape. It's, uh, it's broken in, in some places and it's not great. Uh, so what we did was we, we went through the radio and pulled it out and got it working. We changed out uh, some of the filter capacitors. We put in a new uh, grid coupling capacitor and uh, got the thing to play. And uh, we have been letting it play for a while to make sure we didn't get silver mica disease showing up in the IF cans. Um, and then also the speaker is just barely held together by bug parts. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, it's pretty bad. Um, but we, we went as far as we did with the radio and decided to stop and decided before we went any further with that, let's, let's find out about the clock and see if the clock is going to work uh, because that also could basically spell the end of the project if the clock is just not going to function. So in this part we're going to go after the the uh, clock as a project. Uh, i got some useful information online from some other sources I'm going to talk about when I get to it. Um, so I'm not I'm not the one here showing you how to do this. I'm just using the information other people have provided for all of us and this is a project just showing my experience uh, trying to do it. And uh, I've tried to make a little bit of improvement along the way. We'll see how it turns out. Uh, but uh, hang on. Let's go ahead and get started in part two, the clock. Okay, man, is this clock case a basket case? I'm going to take this outside to clean it up once I get the motor out of it. Ooh, we've got a crack that goes all the way to the front. We've got a piece missing out of the side. It's not Bakelite. This, this is a, just regular thermoplastic. As you can see, it's quite quite snapped. I'm sure we can join that up and I could glass the inside of it if that's what we needed to do. I don't know if still yet if it's worth doing. Let's, uh, let's see what we can do here with the clock. So turn this around and we've got some screws here. I think these are just the cover plate. So we'll just get these out. So in here we got a couple components. One of them is the clock and the other is the switch element. Now the clock is in a hermetically sealed container that is operated by magnetic coupling from uh, a field coil around it that's, of course, oscillating 60 hertz. Okay, let's slide off. Get through there. More roach cases and a spider nest. Yeah, this is like this is like a zoo in here. Yeah, well, maybe. There we go. So here's the clockwork. So the black leads go to this coil that gives a magnetic field that will be oscillating at 60 hertz. This is the motor in here with a gearbox. So the motor is, is reacting to the magnetic field through this. This is sealed. And then the gearbox comes out and it engages the clockwork that's inside of here. Okay. Fun, huh? So our challenge will be to refurbish the oil in here. I saw a really good video by Wardco, W-A-R-D-C-O. He has developed a really good technique for how to get into here, flush these things out replace the oil and seal it back up. I'm going to attempt to do what he did. I thought it was a really good idea. 
and then they seem to work really well. I can get this running, but I don't want to run it for long because I'm afraid it'll you know, start to chew up the gears in there if the oil has gone really bad. Because um, we really want to see if the thing will operate. So the switch is here, appears to me. So let's see if we can figure this all out. Not the, not the gear works, but the... Okay, so that's... Let's move in the time. So this would go around and operate the clock. No, that's the time. It looks like you're also operating the setting of the alarm here, so I don't exactly know how that works. Uh, this has, see it says set alarm, uh, sleep 60, so this is where you time to let it run out and turn off. This is wake up, so you took it this way, and when the alarm goes off, it turns on the radio. Or if you don't want to wait for the alarm, you just want to turn your radio on, you flip it over to manual, and the radio just comes on. Okay. And the coffee pot turns on too, so remember that. <laughs> but what you're looking at is you got holes in this brass plated faceplate, and there's actually maroon behind it. Those aren't painted in numbers, those are holes, and it shows through. So. All right, let me get myself cleared up here and we start looking at this motor assembly. I mentioned earlier that this is completely enclosed and sealed. So that's the mechanism that drives the clock in here. Okay, but let's talk about the, the operation of this. So let's talk about the power going into it. So we turn it over. The power comes in from these two black leads that we have here. Now you remember one of them I mentioned looked like it had been cut and indeed it does look it has been damaged. I can't tell if the wire goes continues through there or not. It does, but I will replace that. So basically the hot leads, the, the leads from the wall come to these two points that drives this coil that then sets up a magnetic field that fluctuates at 60 hertz and that drives the motor that drives the gear works and then that drives the clockwork mechanism. Alright, so that's the clock mechanism. Now as the clock operates, this lead, sorry, this lead joins up to the lead from the wall here and they both join this terminal. Alright, so let me turn this around. Okay, this here is the switch element housing. This is what holds it. The switch is actually, okay, let me see if I can get to where you can see this. The contacts with switch, and yeah, supplemental lighting here, are right in there. Sorry, my hand is shaking. There's the switch contacts right there. And they're operated, strangely enough, by pivoting this phenolic plate. So this phenolic plate goes like that, it operates the switch. Let me see if I can get this where you can possibly see it. Doing my best here, guys. Let's see. Can you see it in there? Gosh, I can see, you can't see it. There's the switch moving. The contact near my thumb is the one that moves, and it comes up to this plate on the left. The plate on the right, which goes to the white wire, is stationary. And it goes up and touches that. Let's see if we can get something reflective behind there. Bear with me a second. Reflective meaning white. You see the gap there. Draw a circle around it. Okay. And now when I move this, you'll see it close. Closed. Right, it can be closed by two ways. Okay, one way is this switch right down here on the bottom. So this switch down here on the bottom is the one where the radio is off, manually on, off, or you want the clock to turn it on when, the, when it goes to the alarm position, okay? So this switch has three positions. It's this shaft, and there's a detent located here. This is the spring that the detent rides on. 
and these little plates in here is where you'll see it. So let me turn it. I can. Look how cheap is this. Okay. Look right here. So those are the positions of the detent. And it, as it goes in those positions, that's for the alarm to set it. That's off, and now I'm going to switch it to on. And when I switch it to on, you'll see what happens here. See how it pushed that? Well, when it did that, it closed the contacts inside there. So then it's on until you switch it back off. I have enough purchase to do it. And then just and then it will allow the contacts to separate again. And they are separated in there, just the paper's not in there anymore. Alright. So then, up here, you can set the clock for sleep. And you do this and you wind this up. And if you, you have to move it past a certain point. There's a little arrow there you can't see right now. Move this. You want to move it past where it says sleep, and that causes this gear to get in there and engage inside there. So it goes like this, and then begins to engage, and it holds uh, the switches closed by leaning on a lever that's inside there, and it comes over, and it's that little hook, and that little hook pushes on there and makes the contacts close. Contacts right in there. Okay. And then also, if you have it in wake up, then when the clock goes into its mechanism mode, it also hits this lever and pulls that up and makes the contact as well. So that's the contact that everything runs through. All right. Um, this up here is how you set the alarm, and I think this is really pretty interesting. So you turn this, and you can set the time. This is that long shaft that comes out. But here's how you set the alarm. You can turn this, and nothing happens. Okay. The reason nothing happens is, look in here, I think this is pretty fascinating. So this thing turns, and it's got this wheel that's just riding with this leaf spring leaning up against it. And that just gives it drag. Well, if you look, that wheel is not engaged. But what you do is you take this and you pull it out. When you pull it out, it comes off of that leaf, switch, leaf spring. And now that gear will engage that gear down there. And now you can turn this, and that will turn the dial that has the alarm time on it. So you set it for 8 o'clock, and then when you're done, just push that back in. And that caused this to just go like that, disengages that wheel, and the clock can continue to run. And then when it reaches that time, it'll kick on the contacts. So that's how the clockwork works. Now, what kind of maintenance does it need? very little. You don't want to put oil on the teeth. Uh, we can look to see if we need to put anything at all on any of these bushings or bearing surfaces. Maybe a tiny amount. If you saw me do the clockwork uh, repair on the Ukrainian clock, you'll see what I'm talking about. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to see if this thing will work, but I'm not going to use this wire because I'm afraid this one's about shot. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to hook up directly to these two leads and see if this thing wants to run at all. So we'll just see, okay? All right, let me get that set up. Bring it right back. Okay, so I've got power hooked up to these two leads. I'm not going through the switch. The switch is in the off position, so the radio won't turn on. So those contacts are not contacting. Uh, white will not get power to it until the switch is contact, and that sends the power to the, uh, to the radio, okay? Uh, all right, so I've already lost my other leads. Let me hook it up. I'm on an isolation transformer, so none of this is connected to the ground I'm set standing on. I have it going through isolation transformer and a dim bulb, and we'll just see if this thing wants to turn at all. Let me just set it down in case we see sparks and flames, and we'll see what we get. So you'll watch the voltage going on here. Turn it down a little bit. Okay, turn up the voltage. Probably needs a minimum amount to jump the gap. Okay, getting 70 milliamps, no glow in the bulb.
there's 100 volts. Now the question is, hey man, is it running? I, I don't know. <laughs> if it is, it's quiet. Oh, now it's going. I'm going to turn this fan off and bring it close to it. You should be able to hear that. Around 100 volts. Okay, let's pull line current. I normally have 123 at the house, but if I wire this up, I'm going to have a thermistor in there. So, hey, Fix, is it running? I hear it turning. The second hand is moving. So we, we got a working clockwork, but we need to fix the motor so it doesn't go bad on us. So I'm going to stop it, and we need to repair that motor, get it lubricated so we don't mess it up. Anyway, that's pretty good. Should we uh, see if we get something through the uh, contacts? I think they're going to work. I don't think we need to worry about that. I just ran, ran through the mechanism on it. It's just contact points. I'll uh, clean up the contacts, but I think this is going to work. So the next thing to do will be to uh, make myself safe here. Okay. So the next thing to do is to uh, do the repair on this motor. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to disconnect these two points on top. See, these are these laminated plates will pivot out on these points back here. So I think if I undo these screws and if these are not loose, I'll loosen those so that this will just kind of spread open. And then I'm thinking I should be able to slip the motor out somehow. Okay, so I'm still learning how this thing works before I take it apart the rest of the way. I learned something else that was very interesting about this is that alarm setting mechanism here where you turn it to set the time that you want the alarm to go off. And it moves that inner dial around to the time you want this to go off. And I was noticing how this could push in and push out. And it had this way where if you push it up, it's off from adjusting. And then, so we can get where you can see it, this gear here is not touching the gear down below. If I pull that out, then it will engage that gear. But I was also noticing how this little mechanism works here. And I was looking about, well, what is what is that doing? And if you watch it, see that right there? So this right here comes up, rides on this cone, and it pushes out against this thing right here. I'll show you that action. See that? So you think, well, what in the world does that thing do? And what it does is it comes down, and there's like a there's like a little dimple there. Focus. A little dimple there. And it engages a little spot down in there. And I'm thinking, is that a contact? No, it can't be. So I'm, I'm looking at this thing, and what, what does this thing do? Well, what it does, I believe, is I think that's part of the alarm. And what happens is, is that when this is in a position where the... Let me see if I get this right. I guess if you pull it out, then I, I don't know. <laughs> when the time comes up for the alarm to come off, something happens in here. Okay, there is a. Uh, oh, I don't know if I can show you. There's a little wheel right there that allows this to drop down even further. Okay, so I'm going to do that. And you may see it click. So what I'm going to do is turn this until the time for the alarm matches the time that it's at or thereabouts. So let's just see what we get here. All right, so as I turn that, I may have to reach up here to get it. I missed it. Now it's coming. Here it comes. It's a little... 
Okay, it just released. And now that plate is touching. So I'm thinking that when this coil is plugged in, this thing rattles and makes the alarm until you push this thing in and it says stop. <laughs> so that allows the alarm to buzz and that makes the buzzing stop. When you push it in. Um, now on the other parts of the mechanism about how it turns power on, this is a part where you, you set yourself to sleep, right? You, you turn this and it'll run down for about 60 minutes and then shut the radio off. So the way that works is it's got this spring-loaded gear that as you turn it, it will engage that set of gears in there. But while it's doing that, when it moves, you'll see it's moving that silver-looking lever. Okay. So if I reach in there and move that silver-looking lever with my thumb, I can get in there. Okay, I'm moving that lever with my thumb. You follow that around. Okay. You see that's where it's pushing on that phenolic plate that's making and breaking the points right there. I know, I can't. It's so dark in there you can't see it. When I get this apart, I'll show you the points better. Now, how does the alarm turn it on? That's how the sleep function works. We already looked at how this turns and operates that. So how does the alarm do it? Well, I haven't quite tracked it down, but I think I found the guilty party. If I look here, there's this little plate right here. And what it does is it curls through and pushes on the other side of a contact. I'm sorry, get this back where we're looking at it. So it curls back into there. There it is. This curved piece right here comes through and moves back out of the way and allows that to come up in contact. I haven't found exactly how that works in the gear mechanism, but it has to do with this shaft and this weird little fork piece that runs back and forth. And it has a little tab, a little tab that runs on the same wheel that's in here that operates the guy that lets this drop. It's hard to see in there. Maybe we'll take a look at it better when we get some of this apart. I don't know. But uh, that's the setup. Pretty cool. Now one of the questions may be, are you going to take the face off? All right. Well, these hands are radium hands, okay? So the white tips on these hands are painted with paint that have radium in it okay and you know it's radium by a couple of reasons when a couple of reasons one of them is I, I happen to know it is the other one is you'll see where this is cracked you see the black or gray compound in there that is a uh, radium nitride did I say uranium a while ago radium that's a radium nitride uh, compound that forms it it instead of oxidizes it binds up with nitrogen in the air and the and it turns that color okay um, I'll, I'll show you another way we can tell here in a minute but uh, you know if you look at the case of this this is not going to be a restoration candidate okay so I'm not going to open this thing up there's no point in it uh, depending on what you read about radium you know you know about the radium girls I'm sure which was a terrible tragedy obviously but after they made some changes with the way they did radium, they did it until I think the 70s or maybe the 80s, and they never had another incident, they say. Um, and basically, they they did some basic safety stuff, including don't lick, don't lick the paintbrush, you know? It kind of, seems kind of silly, but uh, they say that kind of fixed the issue. Uh, yet, on the other hand, if you look, at, look it up, it talks about how toxic it is, and you need to use a glove box and and forced air and all this kind of stuff. So... What it does is, is it ionizes, it, it, it gives off a daughter, which is radon, okay? And it's naturally occurring. It comes out of wherever you see, like even granite, I think, puts it out. And it can accumulate on things like basements and things and parts of the U.S. and other places, and it can be dangerous. 
and where I have here, I'm in an open garage that I open up and the air doesn't really, you know, concentrate in here. But I'm probably never going to take this in the house. I'm not going to have it around kids or anything like that. But uh, we'll show you a little bit more about this in just a minute. So we've been talking about radon uh, as being given off as one of the daughters of the of uh, radium. But um, the thing that's probably more dangerous in my situation here uh, it has to do with the particles. And you see how this is cracked and so forth. There's probably dust from these paint inside this crystal. Okay, that's that's probably one of the main dangers of radium is ingesting it or inhaling it. Okay, uh, what it does is the body recognizes radium as looking like calcium to the body, and that which stays in your body ends up being bound into your bones. And then the radioactive compound goes off, and and it uh, damages your bone marrow and your and your bones. So um, the main issue with this is really the dust that can be released by taking this cover off. You know, and scraping this would be the worst thing you could do. It's like grinding up, you know, asbestos and, and inhaling it. I mean, you know, really, what you want to do is just leave it alone. Is probably the best advice I've heard. So that's what I'm going to do. If for some reason somebody ever wants to redo this, they can take it to a watchmaker that has the right equipment and knows how to do it and can get this off. I'm not going to bother. Uh, but that's what the deal is. You know, I've had a family, close family members put that way, die from radiation poisoning. And I am, I'm just not the right guy to work on this. So I'm no expert on uh, radiation or uh, radium. But uh, one of the things I have is I have this little radiation monitor. It's not really a Geiger counter, I don't think. But it... It uh, is inexpensive, and it registers beta particles and gamma rays and X-rays, I believe. And uh, radium gives off alpha, some beta, and of course they give off gamma. Uh, this does not pick up alpha. So if we're trying to say this is definitely radium versus something else, this can't tell you. Uh, is this calibrated? No, I, I don't have any kind of calibration standard. I have no way of knowing how accurate this is. This is uh, kind of a personal dosimeter, by the way I would kind of think of it. And if you can see, it's kind of looking at microsieverts per hour, okay? And what I'm doing is, it's just to see, you know, is there any radi is there any radioactivity in something at all? Is, you know, is it, uh, does it quack like a duck, okay? If I pick up something from a watch dial, then or clock dial, then I'm pretty safe in assuming, well, it's because of the radium. Um, how, how bad is it or how dense is it? This really can't tell you, apart from, you know, is something taller than the other one? Is it something bigger than the other? And we can kind of look at that. Um, so what it's doing now is it's just measuring background radiation. There's a Geiger-Miller tube in here. And uh, we'll just set this down for a minute. And uh, let me show you, for example, this this vintage watch I would wear. Okay. So you can say, hey man, are you worried about this watch? Well, I can look at it and say, I don't see any anything that looks like there's a painted element to that. But what I can do is just set this on here, the Miller tubes in the back, and just put it back here and see, do I see a big change? I don't see much of a change there. It's going to drift around anyway, just basic background radiation that we have everywhere around the world. But, uh, so that looks pretty good, all right? Let me pull up something else. This is one of my victims that uh, we haven't shown yet. I may or may not ever get around to doing this one. But you can see, look at the fingers, the hands. See the black. So let me put this over here. And let's see what happens. Now I would say it's noticing something, and it's been set to set off an alarm, and uh, it just goes to show that it's got something coming out of there, right? So that is radium, and you could even make the argument that this is even worse than the one we've been working on because it's got a plastic face and it has holes in it, so the radon gas can come out re fairly readily, okay? Um, but in truth, I mean, even the other one that has the glass with the pressed down, I mean, it's a gas. It's not gas tight. You know, the radium's going to be able to get out. So, but anyway, that one has some radiation to it. And what did it do? It got up to three and a half or something like that. 
Let's go back and look at it. It's got to reset. Okay. Okay, so it's about three and a, three to three and a half, somewhere around there. Okay, okay, calm down. And of course, this inverse square. Uh, the further away you get, the size of the area that the I guess gamma rays come through gets enlarged as the square of the distance. So if I held it back here, you know, it'd be a different number. All right, so now let's look at the guy we've been working on. So let me turn this back on. Okay. see this one's going higher. Now, am I going to do a calculation and say how much more is on this one? No, because he's, I don't know how good those numbers are on, but it gives you a higher number. Now, I thought you guys might like to see something kind of interesting. Back in my college days, I ended up getting a uh, old Rolex watch from the 50s. Okay. Like this, I wore this thing for years. On this arm, because <laughs> I'm left-handed. Anyway, you can see it's got loom on the hands, and then every index mark has it. Oh, you can see that. Focus. Will it focus? Okay, so we see what this little guy does. I wore this on my arm for years. Okay, and look how much more it puts out. Now you might be thinking, well, maybe it's the Maybe it's the, the fact that the glass isn't giving you, the crystal isn't giving you much help. Uh, you wear it with the stainless back against your skin. Well, that's true, but let's see how much it helps. I'm resetting it so we don't have to wait for it to average back down. So now I've got the back against it. Trying to find where the Geiger Miller tube is. There you go. So that does help. But still, you're wearing it right against your skin for that length of time, you know. And if I flip it over. Rock and roll, huh? So anyway, that's part of the reason why I'm just not going to, uh, I'm not going to open the clock up and try to restore this thing. There's just no point in it. I know people who do, and that's up to them, uh, but I don't want to leave something laying around for grandkids or anything like that. There's just no point in doing it. Uh, it's, if this was a museum type, you know, case, then maybe I would do that. But, you know, you see what a hunk of junk this is. <laughs> I'm just doing it to get it working. And uh, so anyway, that's the story with that. Now we'll get the uh, see we get the clock motor to work. Okay, let's uh, get the uh, motor apart. I think the correct terminology for all of this is the motor, and Tecron uses the terminology. The part that we're going to remove is the rotor. 
Okay, so I want to keep track of which end is up. We got the Telecron is facing over here towards the 3 o'clock face. It's got some dimples and things that help align it in the right position, so I think I can get it back in there. So I'll take this thing apart now, see if we can get this thing open and get it out of there. You know, a lot of people, you know, getting back to talking about the radium, <clears throat> a lot of people look at these things and see they don't glow anymore, and they think the radium is all gone. Well, what it is, is they, they mix radium in with a fluorescing compound, and the radium is exciting it, and that's the part that glows, is the compound that fluoresces with the radioactivity bombarding it. And over time, the radioactivity uh, degrades that material and it no longer fluoresces but the radium is still there the uh, half-life of the of the radium that is used in these things is 1600 years so the fact that this is 70 years old or so the radium is full strength really so you can't take much comfort in that See the spread. Okay, I'm gonna to have to do some more work in getting these off. They may be glued in place. Hang on. So watchmakers know how to remove radium from hands safely. And it can be done. And by all means have it done. Uh, if you want to try to do it yourself, I mean people have said here's how they do it. It's up to you. You do you. Um at this point I'm not going to. Okay, that part fell out. I believe it was in here. I'll look at some pictures and see how that was. And meanwhile this is spreading open nicely. And let's see, this is hitting that standoff and hitting that standoff. Can I get it off? snuck it out. So you can see the witness marks of the three dimples. One, two, three. But I think that once it goes in there, the position it has to go in one way. Okay, so here is the sealed rotor assembly. Looks like it's an H3 type. And we can look up what year this is. I think this one is that an eight. That says one eight five. So I believe what that is is August of fifty one. Is when this was made. Now is it possible to separate this? It may be but I don't know how to do it. Anyway, as Ward mentioned, you can drill a hole in here and use a solvent to get rid of the old lubricant and then put new lubricant in and seal it. And the way he did it was is he put some solder. He first tried epoxy and then he went in with solder to try to do the solder on it. And uh, you saw me making that little uh, tip. So the hole I'm going to drill is this size right here. I think it's 3 seconds, I believe. And I'm going to verify where on the <clears throat> whereabouts you drill this where you're less likely to cause damage. And uh, I'll do that and get that set up and proceed from there. While I have the rotor assembly out, I will go in and do some basic cleanup in here without getting too aggressive with it. And uh, the teeth on the gears will not need any lubricant. The axles, if you will, uh, I may put just a small amount of lubricant on those. I know there's people that say that you can heat this up 
and then put some lubricant in that little cup there if you will and as it cools it'll draw the lubricant in um, but I'm going to try the solvent first and then then we'll do it okay so what I'm doing here is working on the clock is I was looking a lot at what was being shown about how to drill into the the body of the clock uh, motor and um, Ward was looking at how to get the solder to cover over the hole and he tried it with epoxy and then he tried using solder and he was worried about the solder getting inside the hole and one of his commenters made a helpful suggestion and said that they used to do something similar and what they used was a brass uh, rivet that they dropped into the hole and soldered the head of the rivet to the case I don't have any brass rivets but what I do have is a brass nail so you can see the brass nail has got a little bit of flashing on it uh, it's kind of a looks like a stamping of some kind really uh, there you can see it you can see that flashing there so what I did was I mounted this in my mini mini lathe which we're going to call a Dremel tool and um, I used files needle files and, and others to remove all that flashing that was on there and now what I'm doing is is I'm going to go through and and try to part it off you can see that I've I'm going to leave just a little bit of a shoulder for it to drop down inside of the hole and I'm going to try to part it off below that and I've been working my way through uh, I thought I'd use a, a saw blade to try to get through here and I'll show you how that's working also just took some sandpaper and and dressed up the head of the the nail while it was spinning around so I'll show you how that's going I may try something else too uh, so I've got this turned down at low speed what I'm doing is I'm just taking a, a metal blade a blade for metal and just trying to work my way through I'm doing a part off here I'll get my glasses so let's see So the idea I'm trying to do is just basically create like a part off tool with these little teeth and this is not easy to do. I'm making a lot of brass dust. There we go. I thought I'd also try this file and see if this works. See what I'm doing? Here is our warm <laughs> little cap. And we'll see how that how that does. Let me see if I can get to where you can see that a little better. There. It's just got enough of a shoulder on it. To drop down side the hole I'm going to drill. Come on, focus. There you go. There's the cap. It's got a shoulder on it and it's got just enough of a cylindrical section there to drop inside the hole. Won't go in much, much beyond the thickness of the brass I'm going to drill through and then I'll just solder that down to the outside of the of the case and I think that that'll end up uh, giving us less worry we're gonna have solder or something get down to the mechanism so I think that worked out okay cheaper than buying a lathe just have to be patient ok 
Okay, so following the uh, advice on Wardco's channel, we got the gear, we got the dimple. I've marked it here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill it with a 332nd bit. And I'm going to do a bit of a start here. I've got this turned down to light. Just give myself a place to start. That'll work. That way I didn't bang it with a hammer. I'm going to drop it into this guy here. I think that's reasonably good. Okay, I've even got the depth stop on my drill press set to keep it from getting run away. I can may have it a little too shallow, I can tighten it up. According to what recommendations people have made, I'm going to put a little bit of white lithium grease on here to possibly catch chips. Does it work? I guess it catches some. Uh, probably the ones that are coming out anyway. Does it catch the ones that are going in? I don't know. But it's not going to hurt anything for sure, so I'll do it anyway. Okay, so I believe we are ready to go. Okay, let's do this. I see a lot of shavings going everywhere that aren't held up in the grease so anyway trying to speed up a little bit I can't see. I get my eyes on. Okay. And we are through. Okay, we got ourselves a hole. I will hold it upside down and deburr that a little bit with the drill bit, and then we'll proceed to the next step. Okay, whole drilling step is done. Okay, I got a blunt tip needle, we got some brake clean, got a jar to exhaust it into. I'm going to get the window, the, the uh, garage door open here in just a minute. I'm just going to go in here and give this what they might say is a, a good irrigation. I didn't do the part about heating it up in the oven first. I mean, it's almost, it's almost 95 degrees in the garage, so yeah, we're okay. Okay. 
Brake Clean is a pretty thorough cleaner and it doesn't leave a residue. <clears throat> it dries really fast, quite volatile. But as a solvent goes, it is a heck of a solvent. Let's see if this any of this will come out on its own. Looks pretty clear, huh? Okay, we're going to go down here to the bottom, as Ward did, and see how it works. Find my way through the gear train. It looks pretty clean. I don't... It didn't look like it has much oil in here. Get in there. Now we don't know is whether the teeth were already damaged, you know, from this thing being used before we got it. Um, there is a, a fella online I saw that rebuilds these things. He cuts them open and I mean he treats these things like these are you know clockwork mechanisms as they are and uh, he does version bushings and just really first class looking work. I mean, it still looks pretty, pretty clean. I'm going to go ahead and get this out. Put some fresh in. This syringe I was able to buy at a local feed store. It's for vet purposes. But the needle I got for uh, it's a bottle that you can use for doing uh, flux. It was longer and uh, doesn't have a, a jabby point, as they say. I'm going to do a whole bunch more of this and I'll bring you back after I've done a lot more. So I've done quite a bit of this. I'm removing the last bit. You can tell the color of the uh, the paper towel you can see and been getting some uh, of old oil out of there and I think about got all the brake clean out okay so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let this set upside down for some time hours and uh, we'll see how it does. I'm going to take this outdoors though so this can evaporate out. It won't take long. And, but meanwhile I'm going to set that up and let that, uh, let that dry out. Okay, so I've let this uh, drain and dry, if you will, for, it turned out to be several days. And I've having to do a bunch of other stuff around the house. So uh, it's very much dried out. It uh, has no smell at all of uh, brake clean anymore. And so it's time to put the oil in. Okay. So in a follow-up video Ward did, he mentioned that it would be better to put in a different amount than he recommended in his first video. So I'm going to go with his revised information. I'm going to go with one milliliter of clock oil. Okay, so let's... Get ready to do one milliliter clock oil. Okay. This is the uh, clock oil I used when I did that Ukrainian clock. And I know that the needle and all that is clean because this stuff leaves no residue. And so we're going to go to one milliliter. 
All right, I'm one milliliter. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to kind of move this around so that it kind of hopefully gets a little bit in the gear works, although it's supposed to spread out on its own. There's some plates that help spread the uh, lubricant by capillary action. Okay, we're in. Now before I seal up the hole, it'll be tempting to see if it works <laughs> before I go any further. So let me, let me rig this up for the clock and see if I can get this thing to motor to turn it. Bring you right back. Okay, see how slow that pepped up because it's energizing that coil. You can hear it humming. Okay. That's definitely that little alarm piece I was talking about. Get up. Okay. So now let's see if this will turn the gear get where you can see. You're not watching. It's turning. So you can see it turning. It's working good. See how do I make this thing go quiet again? I've forgotten. There you go. Shut up. <laughs> All right. So you can see the the gear turning. It's turning uh, very quietly, actually. Okay. Now the next challenge is to seal up the hole. So let's see how that goes. Okay, so we've got some rosin on there, RA flux. We've got some solder. And we've got our little cap.
Okay, let's see how this goes, huh? Alright, where's my... Now it doesn't go down perfectly flat because I probably could have put a chamfer on that hole when I drilled it. But you know what? I think I like it not going down quite all the way. I got enough to get solder underneath it, but if I need to get it off, I got something I can get underneath it with. Okay. I've got a uh, 260 watt. Okay, let's see how this goes. I that way to brace my hands here. Gonna flow. It's on the cap. Come on. Come on, steady hands. Okay, now we got it. Okay, we've definitely got it hot. Hope it didn't destroy anything. But I feel comfortable we didn't get any solder into it. Well, we'll just have to see. I'm going to let it cool. It's really hot there. I didn't hope it didn't damage the seal here. Okay, so it's the next day. I've let this thing cool down. And uh, you can see the cap, barely. And you can, yeah, that's right there. And I got a little bit extra solder around the edges, but I didn't want to, I just wanted to quit putting heat into it. I'm satisfied it's fused all the way around really well, you know, blended together. There's no pinholes. So we're just going to see if this thing still works. So let me get uh, the, the uh, shaded pole motor over here and let's see if this rotor works. Okay. To where we can see this. Alright. So I'm going to turn on the voltage to the motor. Let's see. Bring it up to bright. Yeah. 120 volts. Okay, 120 volts. I tightened down the screws that were up here because the coil was buzzing a little bit on the screws when I was doing that test yesterday. So I tightened that down and that seems to have quieted it down quite a bit. Okay, let's pop this in and see if we get anything happening. Okay, it's moving. I tighten it down such I can't even get the coil in here. Let me see if I can help this out just a little bit. A little bit of clutch. 
clearance here. You hear the buzzing now. Okay, let me tighten that back down now. So yeah, quieted that down. All right, it's turning. Look at there. And it's quiet too. That noise you heard was my stomach. <laughs> Uh, we got somebody doing the lawn a couple houses down, but near some mowers. But this thing is totally quiet. I'm gonna go mobile and bring you in close. Okay. So you see where we are, and the microphone is just to the left. So I'm gonna bring it in. I mean, if you can hear anything there, from where I'm sitting, you can't hear anything. So good. Good. We'll take that for the win. Okay. So now what I need to do is uh, clean the rest of this up. I'm not going to go crazy. Maybe do a little bit of lubrication carefully. I won't be hosing this down with WD-40. I'll be making it carefully lubricating just a certain point so it doesn't accumulate junk and dust. I'll bring you back when I got all that done. I'm sure you don't really want to see all that. But yeah. I'll take a win whenever I can get it. All right. Good news. This thing's still wanting to buzz. Let's see if it's still wanting to buzz. Where's the control for that? It's over here? Yeah. We'll see how that all works. Okay, we're going to clean this up. And you may notice what I'm doing is I'm oiling the pivots, the little axle bearings, if you will, but I'm not actually oiling the teeth of the threads. They don't need it. It's not like it's carrying a, a lot of horsepower here. I want to keep it clean. And you just go in there and touch a little bit of where the oil is meant to go and it'll suck it right in. It's the sliding contacts you're trying to address here. I'll get to that that one there in a minute. I cleaned off the old grease that was there. And I'm going to replace it with some lithium grease here in just a minute. See how that's just sucking the oil in. It takes very little.
I'll put a little grease on that detent mechanism too. Okay. I think that's just about it. Yeah, right on the top of that. Okay. I think that's just about does it. Let me put a little bit of white lithium grease on that sliding surface there. Oops. That surface right in there. Good. I said I want to put a little bit up here on this detent. Let's see. Okay. I think I'm ready to put this thing back together and see how it runs. Okay, let's get this put back together again. Uh, I'm going to um, replace this wire, but not right now. I'm going to go ahead and get the thing uh, put back together and we'll see how it works. See if the second hand works, the mechanism works and all of that, and then and then we'll see. Okay, let's move so much smoother now. <laughs> Incredible. Okay. this in here. I guess these spring-loaded posts will go in afterwards. We'll, we'll see. Okay. It probably has to go in just right. So this kind of gives it a spring loading down. Boy, it sure is dark what you're looking at in it. I'm trying my best with the light. Is this any better if I get rid of this? A little bit. I know I'm turning it backwards. Doing it until I could feel that thread drop in. It's a good way to avoid cross threading. Okay. Looks like it's meshed up okay. I hate to tighten it down until I know that it's engaged okay, otherwise, I might mash it up. So, let me give it a little bit of room to move around and we'll see. Okay.
I went right after it, didn't I? And the second hand is moving. If you can see it moving there. So I'm going to go ahead and start snugging it down. Thinking maybe that would help it seat it. But it also made sure that our teeth weren't clashing. Okay. Turn the voltage down a little bit this time. Now let's see what we got. So we got our alarm going off here. Okay. Now let's shut it off. Okay. I still hear a little bit of humming. I've got a little nut I need to tighten down underneath here. I'll get onto that. But that makes it quiet. I turn the voltage up. volts. And we have handage. The clock is running and it's quiet. Let me get in there and tighten up that little nut and I think we're done with this except I need to solder on a new black wire. And I may dress up those points just a little bit while I'm at it. Cool. Thank you, Ward. Good solution. Some things from my youth did survive. Okay, let's see if I can find the right size here. Okay, looking good. Now I'll be uh, changing out this wire and clean the points. We're going to get to see if we can see these points in here. There they are. There you can see them. And I'm going to get in there and clean those guys. I'm going to use something called a flex stone. These are not gold plated by any means. Alright, something like that that engages them. And I'm just giving that just a little freshening up. You can see half of the blade there. Alright, there you go. Yeah, you can see half the blade right there. It's just meant to get the knock the carbon off of them. see what came off. Okay, let's get this guy back into service. Back into the case. Okay guys, I'm going to break this one off here. We got the we got the clock taken care of. I think it's going to work okay. But as you see, we still got a long way to go. Um, 
I'm not going to be doing much more than just hosing this down. I won't show it to you as you don't see it. As far as this goes, I may try to just make it to where it doesn't get any worse. Uh, in terms of the, the chassis, if you remember, we got the radio to work last time. Uh, but we've got a long way to go in terms of getting this thing ready to, to be utilized. As you can see, we still got a lot of old components in here. We did the filter capacitors and the, uh, the uh, grid coupling cap. But I need a couple, couple more of these to get rid of. I've probably still got a chassis capacitor in here I need to get rid of. I think it's this one. And, uh, and do the alignment and all that kind of stuff. So we'll get back into fixing this next time. Uh, until then, appreciate you guys watching. This has been very interesting and appreciate the help of everybody uh, like Ward Co. and others that posted about how to deal with these clocks. And uh, until next time, I'll see you guys later. Thanks.